Gabriella, so nice to see you again. Thank so you so nice to see me. you. So good to see you, Risa. Thank you for having me on again. No, oh. I'm so excited. For anybody who doesn't know Gabriella and her work, you have to check out my other video where we kind of talked about all things, you know, trying to get permanent or temporary residency in Mexico. You are the go-to expert uh, based in Mexico City. Um, so, but today we're going to talk a lot, you know, rehash a little bit of some of the requirements um, yep. that people really need to get residency, whether it's permanent or temporary. And then also a lot of these 2023 changes that have been happening um, that, yeah, may kind of have to make people's plans change just a little bit, right? Yep. Um, yeah, unfortunately. So, there. Um, so tell me a little bit about yourself. How did you get into this work? How long have you been living in Mexico City? Um, so I'm originally from the States. I studied abroad in Mexico when I was in college and returned annually or twice a year if I could um, to visit the host family that I lived with. My parents have a home in northern Mexico on the Sea of Cortez in Puerto Penasco, or known to us gringos as Rocky Point, um, driving distance from Arizona. So Mexico has always kind of been my backyard, my second home, and I was determined to move back here. Um, so I did that in 2020 um, and worked for some educational organizations at first. And then due to the pandemic, um, had to kind of shift like a lot of people did, unfortunately, but it worked out in my favor. I um, had someone that was doing this work and asked me to join him, hired me to assist him. And then um, we kind of started focusing each of us on our own uh like our own areas because there's various routes to residency. And so I do the standard, I do focus mainly on the standard routes to residency. He likes to take on the more complicated cases. So, um, yeah, I started doing that and it's just, it's just exploded. Everyone wants to be in Mexico or at least a lot of people want to be in Mexico. And, um, it's been a great, a great time helping people move here, uh, adjust to life in Mexico too. I don't, um, just do visas now, assist with the visa process. Like today, I'm going to help someone get their health insurance here and, um, you know, find apartments. I do relocation tours here where I take people around to different neighborhoods and just check them out, take them to see apartments to get a sense of like what the cost of living is. Cause each neighborhood varies quite significantly. Um, and you know, get a feel for the vibe of the neighborhood. Um, and other things like getting their tax ID number, just basically any type of bureaucratic process <laughs> that you'll need coming to Mexico. Either I or a member from my team, um, I have this fabulous assistant. He's this young guy, uh, trilingual, and so there are certain things that I let him specialize in, and then I focus on the residency work. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. And what a valuable service, right? Because... I feel like, you know, if you're going to make this big move, it's really good to have, you know, have someone holding your hand while you're, you're doing it, which is awesome. Exactly. Um, so who, you know, we, we decide, okay, maybe I'm going to move to, to Mexico part-time first. Maybe I'm going to rent. I'm going to feel it out. At what point should people really be seriously thinking about temporary residency and then permanent residency? So if they're someone that wants, knows they want to be here for longer than six months out of the year or someone that has been coming regularly and they, and they come regularly. So even if it's three months out of the year, but it's twice a year or if it's it, it basically <coughs> anyone that knows that they want to spend a good chunk of their time in Mexico, it's highly advisable to get residency. Because at any point, the Mexican government, when you enter Mexico, you get what is called, well, and, and, that, and that's actually something that's changed. You get a stamp in your visa and, I'm sorry, a stamp in your passport that is uh, like a tourist permit. It's not a visa, but it's a tourist permit. And if you're, they, everything's now digitized. So if they can see all of your entries and all of your exits. So they know if you're someone that's been coming a lot and if you're coming just for tourism, but you're coming, you know, every six months and then leaving for a week and then coming back every six months, they know that you're not just here for tourism, that you're living here. Or, you know, you may 
truly just come for tourism, be like, oh, I'd like to hang out in Mexico City, you know, when it's a tundra here in Minnesota, and, you know, you spend your winters here, um, they may at some point you come in and instead of getting your 180 days, they say, nope, you get 20. And you can only legally be in the country for 20 days because you have come in regularly. You are a temporary resident. You, you know, you reside here enough or you're, you're here frequently enough that we can consider you a resident. Right. So then that means, so as a tourist, even though it says you can stay up to 180 days, it's mm -hmm. up to the discretion of the immigration officer as when to you whether enter. he grants that to you, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's not an automatic 180. It is, it is by agent's discretion. And a lot of times they will, they were stopping us for a while, but then they've started again. I'm, I'm hearing like mixed reviews. Um, to be quite honest, I've tried to stay away from Facebook because it kind of makes me crazy reading all the different all the different stories because it's so inconsistent. I mean, there's no rhyme or reason to what they're doing. But um, yeah, you can come in and they can say, we need your exit ticket. Like we need to know when you're exiting the country. Or you can say you're coming for 10 days and they give you 12. Um, or you can say you're coming for 10, they ask you how long you're going to be here and they stamp 180 and you're on your merry way. Um, it, it, there's really no rhyme or reason. So if you're someone that knows that you want to be coming, a lot or you know consistently or staying for longer periods of time better to be safe than sorry because there is the benefit is there is no in-country requirement so if you are you know a snowbird in Mexico you don't have to be in Mexico for six months out of the year like some of these other countries Panama for example is one of them um, like Ecuador, I think, is another place that a lot of my clients, you know, try. They require you, if you're a resident, to actually be inside the country for a certain period of time to continue your residency, whereas Mexico doesn't, at least at this point. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. so, so, okay, so if someone wants to start the process for a permanent residency, um, mm -hmm. what do they do? Where do they go? So for temporary or permanent, either one, you start the process outside the country at a consulate. So um, it's easiest if done in your home country because bank statements, they, they require bank statements. Um, sometimes they'll require an employer letter. And so, for example, if you are German and you want to go to the U.S., you're going to need to find a consulate that will accept you. And there are some that will. But then you're going to also probably need to go to your embassy here. Like, say you're already in Mexico and you're like, okay, I'm, it's ready. It's time to get legal. I'm kind of thinking of a combination of some clients that I already have. It's time to get legal. So you, they would need to go get their stuff translated. Like, say you have German bank documents translated and then also kind of certified or, or notarized by their embassy to then take to the U.S., um, to go to a U.S. consulate. I mean, it's easiest to go to the U.S. because it's closest, but you can kind of, you can go wherever they will allow you. Um, but yeah, you have to start, you do have to start outside of Mexico unless you are married to a Mexican citizen, you have a child born on Mexican soil, or you qualify for what is called the regularization program, which is a... Um, program that is has very strict requirements and it differs again in every city in Mexico and every immigration office not every office um, honors it and I pers it was, I, I personally wouldn't even go that route um, unless you know you know for a fact that you qualify it's based on having expired tourist permit having previous entries to Mexico um, a variety of different qualifications so my suggestion is to go the economic solvency route unless you're married to a Mexican citizen or have a baby on Mexican soil. Those are the two routes um, that you can start the process in country. Wow. And so how much does it generally cost to get permanent residency? How much should people be budgeting? In order, okay, so to get temporary residency and get permanent residency, it does actually. Every consulate differs a little bit. Um, so temporary residency, you need to show approximately 3000 us dollars per month in income for six months. Um, or you can show investments or savings of approximately, um, 
55,000 US dollars ending balance for the last 12 months. Um, and that has to be the ending balance. Like you can't have one month where, you know, I know the stock market's a little crazy right now. You can't have one month where you dip down to 47 and then the next month it was at 64 and you say, but it still averages out to be, no, it doesn't work that way. It has to be the ending balance every month. That's for temporary residency. And that is mainly, temporary residency is pretty much for anyone that is not of retirement age and or a retiree. And that will differ depending on which consulate you go to. Last year. Retirement age. What's considered retirement 62. age? 62. Okay. 62. Yeah. And some offices will allow you, will grant permanent residency if you are retired, but not 62, but you still have to be kind of in retirement, like 57, 58, you know, in a, in a realistic retirement age. Um, last year, that was, it was a lot easier to get permanent residency if you were younger or not of retirement age or not retired. I had some 30 year olds granted it. I had, you know, because financially they met the requirements and that was all that mattered, but they have cracked down on that. I don't know of any offices that I have heard of personally. I obviously I haven't worked with every single consulate in the world and or in the U S um, where anybody's gotten permanent residency based on income or investments alone this year. All of them have been uh, retired, been required to be a retiree, prove retirement, so like via social security statement or um, you, whatever you get when you retire, like from your 401k or your company, etc. And for permanent residency, if you are retired, the qualifications are like 5000 a month approximately. Um, in pension or retirement or 180 um, or so in investments. So you can show, you know, an investment account. Um, you can say, I'm retired, prove that you're retired, and then show an investment account. So that and, has to be actual cash, though. That can't be, like, held up in a property that's worth, you know, 500000 Correct. Correct. Yep. You can't. Now, I know people that have qualified on Airbnb income, showed that, you know, that they have Airbnbs and that they, they own these properties and that their income is coming from owning these properties, but they didn't come in and say, this is the title and the deed to my house. This is the value of it. This shows that, you know, it's paid off. I've never had, an, I've never seen that. There is one route where you can come to Mexico. You can qualify for a residency based on ownership of a property in Mexico, but very few consulates actually acknowledge it, even though it's it's one of the three routes. And it's supposed to be, uh, I always say approximately because every, every office is so different, but around 350 to 380,000 US dollar equivalent, and you have to own it free and clear. And sometimes you can qualify for residency based on that ownership of property in Mexico. But yeah, it wouldn't work like say, you know, you have a house in in the States worth 500000 it's paid off free and clear. That doesn't matter because that's not liquid cash or right. liquidatable, you know, quickly liquidatable. Right. right. Um, and so then what are some of the out-of-pocket costs that you would have to pay in order to get your residency? And also so, uh -huh. permanent, uh, temporary residency lasts for how many years? So temporary residency, the, uh, the initial year is one year and then you're able to renew after one year for three, for three years at once. And then after those three years are up, you can convert to permanent residency if you choose to. Which I guess is better because then so, you don't have to keep return. You don't have to keep renewing. Yes. And it's cheaper. Um, the fee. Yeah. The fee. So you don't pay the fee, you know, the annual fee times three. It's like, um, actually I can look exactly what it is. It's, 50, oh, it's 5108 for one year currently. It goes up every year on January 1st. So it's 5108 pesos, which comes out to about 278 US dollars right now with the current exchange rate. And um, it's that's for one year. And then the renewal is 9,226 pesos. So you save a little over a year in fees if you do the three years. 
So, and that's what most people choose to do unless they know that they're only here, you know, like I'm going to do two years in Mexico and then I'm going to, or whatever, but yeah. Um, but yeah, most people choose to renew for the three years. So you don't have to come back. You don't have to deal with the paperwork. You don't have to pay the fees. And especially since the fees go up every year. So yeah, that's the route to go. So what um, are some of these changes that you're starting to see, um, that are affecting people who are applying for residency now? I mean, the biggest change was the increase in the, the requirement increase. So it went up 20%. The, the consulate requirements are based on Mexico City minimum wage. In temporary residency, you're required to have $3,000 per month now showing an income. And before Correct. It was, is that what you're it was, saying? It was between 21 and 20, 27 was the highest I knew of. That was Milwaukee. It was like 27.70 last year. And now it's there, there are two offices that's, that are still around 2,600, Phoenix, to Arizona, and McAllen, Texas. And then the rest are in the 3,000 to 3,300 range um, per month. So yeah, the increase, the increase is significant. Um, and I actually, in Canada, um, it went, apparently it went up even more. I don't, I'm really bad with exchange rates and things like that, but I, a lot of Canadians have said that it went up more than 20%. Um, and what has also, we've also seen is that some offices don't adjust annually and then all of a sudden they'll adjust, they'll adjust their like 2018, you know, they were still running on like 2018, 2019 requirements and then they all of a sudden do this huge adjustment to 2023 requirements. So it looks like they went up, you know, 40, 50%, which is possible. And I think the key this. thing here is that it really depends on the consulate. You had said that the last time we had spoken. Yes. Uh, so it's not like across the board. You really have to no. check with your local city. Yes. So that's another thing um, that's kind of changed. It's a subtle changes that I've seen. So you also aren't required to go to the consulate in your city. But like say you don't qualify in Philadelphia, for example, um, but you do qualify in McAllen, Texas. If you're willing to travel, there, there are offices that you can go to. However, that is another subtle thing that we've been seeing is that some of those offices that allowed anybody from anywhere to come are now requiring that you show proof of residency in their jurisdiction. So some of the easier offices or some of the more flexible offices or just friendlier offices that I've heard of um, have now require you to actually be in their jurisdiction. How do you know which is a more friendly juris, you know, consulate to word to of go mouth, <laughs> word of mouth. So yeah, you know, you hear about, you hear about people's experiences and people will tell you and like the, there's a bunch of WhatsApp chats dedicated to residency. There are various um, Facebook groups. There's a Facebook group called getting Mexico resident or getting Mexican residency. I should know the name of it because I'm one of the admins, but it's called getting Mexican residency. And you know, people will go in there and, you know, talk about their experiences. Oh, I went to this consulate. They did this. They requested this. This is exactly what they wanted. We need to do this. And that's actually a really good spot to get, even though, you know, going to Facebook for all of your information isn't what I suggest everyone to do, but it's, it is a good starting point to get anecdotal information to be like, oh, I would never have thought about that. This is what Leamington required, um, you know, because I'm going to be traveling six hours to get there, especially in the tundra of Canada, things are a little more spread out than, uh, and um, nothing against Canada. I just, I'm from Arizona. I can't even comprehend. <laughs> I can't even comprehend that type of weather. Um, and, you know, if you're going to be dedicating a day, two days, a week to fly somewhere, you know, you want to make sure that you have everything. So even though an agent might ask someone for something at that consulate, they might not ask the next person, but it's, I always say be overprepared rather than underprepared. So it is a good starting point. It's a good place to ask questions. You know, a lot of people will come in and say, hey, I'm going to this consulate. Has anybody been there? You know, what did they ask of you? How long did it take? Um, one other little change that I've seen is that some of the offices that used to give you the stamp immediately, so you go to the consulate, you bring all of your documents. First, you make your appointment. Then you go, you bring all your documents, your bank statements, your marriage certificate if it's needed, your children's birth certificates if it's needed, and I can explain more about that in a second. And you bring everything in, and then um, 
they used to review it and most of them typically would then just say you're approved, take your passport in the back, you'd wait like half an hour and you'd come up with this little ironed in passport, I mean uh, visa in your passport. Some offices now are not doing that immediately. So you have to, you know, like wait 10 days to go back for your approval or wait and go pick up your passport or, um, you know, you're not, yeah, you're not getting it immediately. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Like if you're someone that I know that Chicago, for example, can take some time. I know New York can take some time. Phoenix has also been doing this recently where you, you don't get it immediately. I've had a couple people say, oh, yeah, I got to go back and pick up my passport from the consulate on Friday. And so it's not. So these are little things to also keep in mind. Um, why they're doing that, I don't know. But I've seen it more than in the past. Maybe it's just because they're super busy and a specific person has to iron it. You know, I don't, I don't really know the reasoning behind that. But um, I've just seen it happen. How much time should people allot to get that visa process taken care of? So say, you know, they know they're going to go to Mexico in December. When should they, but they would like to go as a permanent resident or a temporary resident. Uh -huh. um, how far in advance should they be planning? So it, the visa, once you are approved, you have 180 days to get to Mexico. And then once you're in the country, you have to go to immigration within 30 days to convert that visa into your card. The longest part of the process on the visa end is getting an appointment at the consulate. So if you know for a fact that you're packing up, you know, you're coming down, selling the house, I would start at least start six months in advance because you have six months to get to Mexico. So I wouldn't start more than six months because if you can't come before that visa runs out, then you have to start over. So you need, so no, I would start 180 days in advance, but no more than that, um, unless they have some flexibility to be able to come down, get their card, and then go back and take care of things, which some people do. But if it's somebody, you know, if you're making a big move from somewhere far away, I would definitely start 180 days in advance. And even, actually, maybe a little bit before that because it can take a while to get the, the consulate appointment. But definitely, um, definitely no more than six months. Definitely not to have their consulate appointment no more than six months, but it can take a couple months sometimes to get a consulate appointment. Sometimes it can take two days. So it right. just depends kind of where you live and what, you know, what the availability is. And it's easier this time of year than it, at the end of the year, everybody's rushing. So if it's someone that wants to come in December, I would definitely start working on it in July. Because come October, it's going to be packed. Everybody's trying to, you know, crunch before the numbers go up for the following year, before there are any changes, etc. So definitely the sooner the better, especially if they're aiming towards the end of the year. That makes sense, right? To do it during low season, mm -hmm. uh, you know, going from the spring into the into the summertime. I think exactly. that that's the case for a lot of things when it comes to Mexico. I just feel like, you know, that whole winter months, like everybody's yeah. down there and everybody's yeah. trying to get it done. And it just, the, just the numbers, it's just a math game, right? There's just yeah. so many people down there. So exactly. Yeah. Um, like right now you could probably get an appointment, maybe two weeks booked out at a consulate. Whereas that same consulate come October, if you were to email them, they might be like, we have something available on January 6th of 2024. You know, so just, yeah, it just depends. So the sooner the better, but not more, not where you're going to be in position where your visa is going to be expiring before you can actually get to Mexico. That's great. That's great. So as we kind of wrap this up, um, so people who are looking to relocate, so they, they get their visa. What are some of the other kind of big ticket items, things that they should really be thinking about before they even get to Mexico, right? Um, yeah. There are certain things that you recommend to your clients? Um, I mean, the main thing is residency, and then it kind of depends on what they're going to be doing here. You know, if they're going to be just hanging out, retiring on the beach, living their own life, you know, um, they might be wanting to get a bank account, um, and some banks require you to have a tax ID number. It's called the RFC which stands for Registro Federal de 
contribuyentes. Um, and that is done via the SAT tax office. Um, some banks don't require the RFC. Um, a lot of people ask about the CURP. They're like, oh, do you help me get my CURP? Your CURP actually comes with your residency card. It's literally printed on it. Um, and what a is CURP that? is, it's kind of like a Mexican social security number, but it's not because if you want to get health insurance here, you want to say you want to get the state health insurance just for like emergencies or backup or whatever, um, you actually have to also request a Mexican social security number. So they're slightly different in regards to their, to their, what they do. Um, your CURP is, they ask for your CURP, um, I don't know, when have I ever been asked for my CURP? I don't know, everybody has a CURP. It's nationals and foreigners alike, uh, foreign, foreign residents alike. Everybody has a CURP. That's C-U-R-P. And then, yep, C-U-R-P. And then, um, Depending on how long someone's going to stay, so a lot of people will come and they want short-term housing. That's real. It's in Mexico City, I don't know so much about other cities, but Mexico City, short-term housing is really hard to come by. Um, you know, landlords really want you to get one-year leases, and if you're signing a lease, a lot of this is another benefit to having residency. A lot of landlords and a lot of realtors that I partner with or that I, you know, are in my kind of circle. Um, won't work with people without residency. It's just too much of a, it's too high of a risk for them. Mm -hmm. And so they want to know that you have your residency card, that you're, you know, that you aren't, because they don't want to get someone, you know, that has 180 day FMM, they leave and come back in, think they're gonna get 100, another 180 days, they get 27 days and they're like, well, peace out. And then, you know, they leave this poor landlord high and dry. Um, so the apartment hunt, the apartment hunt can be kind of challenging here. Um, there are some things that make it a little bit harder. They require, a lot of places require what's called an aval, and that's a, um, a kind of like the equivalent of a cosigner, uh, but they have to own property in Mexico City. But there, there are ways around that um, that I can explain maybe in another video. <laughs> and um, so this doesn't go too long. And um, let me think, what else? Mainly the housing, if your children are going to be going to school, because the schooling here, you're going to, most foreigners put their children in private schools here. There are very few children go to public schools here, um, just because the education system is so different, and it's, um, it's more attractive to the foreigners to put their children in private schools. So, you know, looking at the best school, school for your children and um, looking at the best situation for your family and uh, something to keep in mind is the traffic in Mexico City and commuting and where you want to live and if, if you're coming here for a job, if you're going to be working, you want to be close to where you work. Um, and then health insurance, we have a state or like a federal, a government funded health program. Um, it's minimal, like you still have to pay for it, but it's minimal, it's very inexpensive. It's called EMS, I-M-S-S, -S, and residents can apply for it. Can you the go to private hospitals with it, or? No, private hospitals would either be out of pocket or self-pay, or um, you can also apply, and I don't know much about it, you can, but um, you can also get private Mexican medical insurance, which I've heard can be really pricey. Just kind of depends on what, you know, your medical needs are, if you're a person with, um, you know, higher medical needs than others. Yeah, I, I know I, health insurance can, is a whole other um, kind of tricky Yeah, topic. it's a whole other, whole other thing. But I know, you know, it, dep and it depends on your age. Like, if you're 30 and, you know, uh, you don't really go to the doctor very often. I know a lot of people that they're like, living in Mexico is my insurance. Because going to a private doctor, you know, is the equivalent of what my copay is in the U.S. Like... And, and it's true, you know. Um, what, uh, what other little things to think about? Um, mainly, yeah, banking, health insurance, housing, pretty much the same things that you would consider, you know, even if you were just moving different states or different provinces or, um, you know, what, how, how are things going to work. But Yeah, I, no, that's great. That's so I great. I did want to touch real quick on something you'd asked and then I interrupted you. <laughs> um, Out-of-pocket costs for getting residency. Um, 
as people sometimes are blindsided by this. So the, to apply for the visa at the consulate is $51 US dollars, and in, in Canada it's, I don't know, 63 I think, Canadian dollars. Um, and then the INM fees when you get to Mexico. So some people think, oh, I just go and I get my card and I'm done. No, like you have to pay those 5108 or the 90, well, not 92.26 unless you're renewing, or um, it's like 6,000 something for permanent residency and then 5108. So some people get down here and they're like, what? I have another $300 I have to pay to finish this process? Whoa, I had no idea. And then if they want to hire a facilitator or a lawyer to help them through the process too, you know, the rates for that vary. They should, they're, they're between like 3,000 and 7,000 pesos is a realistic price to pay a realtor, a realtor, I'm sorry, a immigration facilitator, facilitator or attorney um, to help you get through the process. That's awesome. Gabriella, thank you so much. This is so, so valuable. Um, for anybody who is looking to, you know, make that jump over to Mexico and get some residency going on. Um, so if people want to reach you, how do they do so? Um, by email. My email is Dr. D-R-G, like Gabrielle, residency at gmail.com. Find me on my Facebook page, which is Dr. G Mexican Residency. And then via that, they can either send me a message and they'll get an auto response with my WhatsApp. Um, phone number. So those are the best ways to get a hold of me. Awesome. Gabriella, thank you so, so much. This is Thank you, Risa. So good to see you again.